lot of light. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Super Salone. It's really a pleasure to have you here today and in the next days for the talks, for the screenings, for the, of course, the exhibitors. It's a pleasure to be here in presence. It's a pleasure to meet, to see each other and to visit the same place and have the same feeling. I'm, let's say, a filmmaker as well, uh, as a curator, and I always say that to watch a film together, it's different uh, than watching alone on, on our screen or computer or phone, because life is about sharing, especially emotions, ideas, concepts. So we are very, very, let's say, lucky, and it was a long way to hear to have this super salone happening, but uh, it's really an important statement for the industry, for the curators, for the designers, for everybody to be here uh, in September, and even if it's not at the established per period for the Salone del Mobile, but let's say that uh, it's really very important for you and for the people uh, all around uh, Milan, Europe, uh, and the ones that could fly and join us. So please invite your friends, your families, everybody to come and share. Uh, I'm very thanked also to Andrea from Forma Fantasma and Philippe Malouin for joining us today. Uh, let's say that they, they both did their efforts to join us. Uh, the, let's say that the, the person behind this was, is Maria Cristina Didero, the curator of the Open Talks uh, at the Super Salone, so we have to thank her. Sh she's uh, here with us somehow. She's the link between many people uh, at the Open Talks, so we are very, very uh, happy also that we could today meet and be on the same stage. <laughs> The, the, let's say, topic today is not a, a very easy one, but we have uh, two important guests that could share and, and help us to understand more about radical. Today's radicals is the, the, the topic of this talk. And why? Uh, I think that I was asked to, to moderate, to be here with you today, because me and Maria Cristina, we did a film about radical design, Italian radical design, a movement of the 70s. Some of the pieces of that time are still in production, so it was a very important movement for Italy, especially from abroad. We had a lot of people to interview in the film, and many of them were coming from all over the world and were interested into Italian design because of that time of the era of design, let's say. It was a very strong moment, probably strong as it is now for different reasons. It was a very political, engaged and strong movement that was uh, uh, dialogue, having a dialogue with the society, with uh, what was going on at the time. Uh, there was the <laughs> many things were happening the 68 uh, generation, let's say, there was the, the Vietnam War, the, there were many political uh, uh, issues to discuss. And design for the first time was there, was in the street, designers were helping, supporting, and sharing uh, uh, a changing world. Today we have, uh, in a different perspective, but we are changing the world as well, because the world is, is asking us to be different, to think different, to open up to different ideas and concepts. So I would like to start, uh, well, with a very short presentation, then we will know more about uh, Andrea Trimarchi and Philippe Malouin, because uh, there are two radicals today. Philippe is uh, living in, in London for the time, we don't know, maybe he's moving, he will tell us more and in Athens for a, for a little period now because he has an exhibition opening. He is a Canadian, originally from Quebec, and together with the Forma Fantasma, they share a common background because they both studied at the Academy of Eindhoven, which is one of the most radical, probably, academy uh, in Europe, for sure. Uh, so they have something in common, and we will discuss about it. 
they are both, uh, let's say, doing uh, different things, not just designing pieces for the industry, for the companies. Of course, it's part of their DNA of their job, but they are both questioning what is design, what is going on, what is the process between a project, an object, a thing that we have in our home, in our office, in our car, let's say. So it's very interesting to talk with them today about radical because they are both uh, changing the way the design is and the approach to design, I think. Allora, starting from Philip, who is far from me, uh, what do you think is radical today and what is the, the link to the future, to the society, to, to what's going on in design? Uh, one thing, hi, thank you for having me. Thank you, Mara Cristina. Um, I think what's radical uh, today to me is the work created by uh, young students and uh, the fact that a lot of them focus on issues that are related to their community, the environments that they live in, the cities that they live in, and they are, it feels to me from a lot of the works that I've reviewed, I'll show some examples uh, later on, that uh, you have this uh, care and capacity to care for your community, which is something that uh, when I was in school, it was, I suppose, more important to, to, to focus on your own work and how it spoke to the rest of the world and have this identity about yourself, whereas I, f I think the young radicals today are the ones who are helping each other, and I find that pretty radical. Bene, Andrea and Simone, you are a group. Yeah, of course, it's day. a pity that Simone is not here with me today. It might appear in a certain Maybe. moment in our screen. Up, up. We'll I see. hope so. His um, flight was late, but let's say that another interesting uh, topic of the radical movement was the collaboration between exactly. different groups and different people. And you were born, in a way, as a duo. Exactly. Well, we started since the beginning as a duo. Maybe we can speak a bit later about it. Well, coming back to your question, I think you said it very well. I think, um, you know, if you think about, and we need to frame uh, the radical today, thinking about the radical of the past. And I think exactly, it's happening the, exactly the same things that was happening in the wake of the 70s. So there is social injustice, immigration, scarcity of resources. And of course, we are also adding a lot of other at uh, to this period, of course, with the you know, the elephant in the room that is climate change, that probably is the sum up of everything. Um, of course, there is a new generation of designers. We are also part of this generation. They are trying to rethink design uh, from really from scratch. And uh, of course, we need to be visionary, but I think vision is not enough anymore. We cannot be an, any more utopic. I think utopia is definitely important in this moment to really think for warned. But what, is, what it means today is actually really to think about what is possible. And I think uh, the next, this generation of designers, and I think we are all part of it, we really want to do it. And we want to make sure that uh, we use the resource better, we work with communities, and uh, we approach uh, our discipline in a different way. Design is very an interesting discipline because it's really in between the extraction of material, the processing of it, and the transformation into desirable object and I think our role as designer is to be aware of all this chain so for me radical today means really thinking about um, not only the product but also everything that encompasses the product. As I said before, as I mentioned before, you both share the uh, Eindhoven Academy as part of your uh, let's say, learning and approach also to, to design. Uh, that is a very important topic as well because schools also in the 70s were the places of changement, were the places where people learn how to, not just to design a good piece, but, but also how to, let's say, inflate design with uh, thinking, with emotions, uh, with a different uh, way of uh, looking at an object. Uh, why do you think the academy, we have a lot of important universities in Milan and in Italy, we have many, many, let's say, teachers, professors, uh, designers who are also teaching. Uh, why do you think that this kind of academy is still very important and how did it change your life? Um, uh, just the same as with Radical Design, whereas the two main schools were in Turin and Naples, which uh, very, very much influenced an ideology that a lot of students were uh, coming together. 
uh, Design Academy Eindhoven to me was important at the time because I found it extremely radical. Uh, I'll talk about it in the slides a little bit uh, later on, but uh, as you know, a lot of the alumni of Design Academy Eindhoven worked uh, at one point or another for Drug Design, and uh, at the time that's one of the main reasons why I was interested in it. Uh, Eindhoven uh, was just uh, offering, uh, I came, I was currently in Montreal where I was, I was in an uh, industrial design school, uh, very traditional industrial design, uh, designing, um, you know, r gas reservoirs for cars and things like that, and very, uh, and then when I, I, I discovered Design Academy Eindhoven, I really was drawn to it and left Canada, and and went to uh, DAE to uh, try and just think differently about design. And that at the time to me was extremely radical. And I was able to perhaps use the industrial design knowledge that I had, which was very traditional and uh, adopt perhaps a more experimental and artistic approach, which Design Academy uh, very much um, encouraged. And um, that's one of the big, big reasons why it was important to me to uh, move to Europe. So Andrea, you and Simone, you met in Florence, but then you studied... Exactly. Together. Well, I, I would say that uh, we started to look into a more uh, forward-thinking design already since the BA. So, and I mean, you did a BA in, in Eindhoven, indeed. Uh, we did a BA in, in Firenze at uh, ISEA, and actually was the first design education that was born in those years, actually, and actually were founded by the radicals, Italian movement, so Gilberto Corretti and others were all part of the, uh, the founders of the uh, design uh, school in Florence. Um, things changed when we were studying in the end of the 90s, you know, those radical ideas were not there, and uh, we were becoming perfect tool for industry. So as exactly like Philippe, you know, we were trained to do a perfect design on CAD and 3D drawings, but, you know, we were missing completely the bigger pictures. And I remember at the time we were coming to Salone and we were going to drug design exhibition. And it was, uh, for us, it was enlightening to see an entire generation that actually was our generation. So the people of drug design, they were students, you know, graduated from design academy and also other education, were young. 25, 24, they, they had their own studios, they were already out of there exhibiting design. And, that, and then for us it was shocking, you know, it was like completely, you know, we, we were blown mind on the fact that, you know, there was a country like the Netherlands that was promoting the work of people and they were giving voice to that generation. And I have to say in this regard, you know, uh, Italy did very badly in the, the last 20 years. I think right. things are changing nowadays. The government was also helping to supporting uh, to support young designers have their own studio. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, like when we when we finished studying, we we had like a studio for 150 euro. It, it was like amazing, and we were in a very ugly one, by the way. It was like a mental hospital, but you know, we had it. But it, it was that's great. for growing and for going no, for doing better, starting no, from. The garage. Exactly, but then you, gave, you got the possibility to do it. Um, then, of course, after we started to be teaching, now we had the department there, so of course the role changed, but I think the, the, the way of like, uh, the approaching design in Design Academy is still the same. I think, of course, the shift, there is a shift between when we were studying, you know, there there was much more about the affirmation of a designer, so, and I think we were in the last years of a generation of uh, um, almost like artistic practice related to design. I think now the new generation don't care about that. They are much more interested in uh, common practice. Uh, and so there is a shift, but uh, the Design Academy is still definitely a, a good school, but there are also very good others in this moment, so. So what do you mean by common practices? Let's say, let, well, you, you could see also, yeah, I mean, like there are a lot, you can see especially in architecture, but in design a lot, where there are not any more uh, singular designers, but they are group, you know, they are not called with their name and they are, you know, uh, sharing like the, the baggage of having a studio that, by the way, is very, <laughs> I think we can say, it's one of the most difficult things ever, you know, to have a design studio nowadays. Um, and I mean, you can see also from, you know, the, uh, the Turner Prize this year, you know, uh, with cooking section, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a common practice and it is not anymore about only design, but there is this uh, mix between different disciplines, between architecture and design art, you know, there's not any more boundaries. And definitely, you know, the sharing of this experience, it's uh, something that is happening more and more. 
So the, the ego, Philip, the ego of the designers are not so much, uh, let's say, so strong as they were before. Uh, do you think there is a kind of uh, an attitude that has changed because, again, the world is different today and we are more conscious about, you know, the planet, what's going on in the world, not just in our small field, but in uh, generally speaking, that is very important to produce for the future and to think about the future is very important. Yeah, I think it's definitely uh, the, the, the era of the star designer uh, has passed, which I think is a good thing. Uh, it's not as important as it used to be. And uh, as you said, the, the group practices that are winning the Turner Prize uh, uh, are dazzling with uh, just creativity that is collective and that isn't just solely centered on promoting yourself or promoting your idea. And uh, well, the interesting thing is that we are both our studios. We have one foot in this world and, and another foot in another world. So uh, I think the important thing is for us to look at how things are made and why they're why things are made, which is definitely something uh, that Forma Fantasma does extremely well, questioning uh, why um, and and how how everything is produced and why the use of wood, uh, biodiversity, etc. And um, I believe that for our practice, we're um, trying to just explore or different ways of working and just making both uh, on one side experimentations in order to see how things could work in the future and on the other side just focusing on industrial standard practices and how we can exist within that world uh, simultaneously between both. Bene, Philippe, I think it's time to show some of your works. So for if we have the presentation ready uh, for Philippe, so you can Tell us a little bit more about your work deeply, understanding what you do. Um, that's my name, I'm Philippe Malouin. <laughs> Um, okay, so I think um, we we were talking about uh, what is radical. This is Sarah de Campos. She won the um, she won the design grand prize at Villa Noai last year. She uh, used design the power of design in order to uh, to help her community. She came from a, a wine uh, country in Portugal, and she focused on uh, her graduation project on uh, helping her own community and the workers that were there in order to collect grapes properly unload them and put them on a truck without hurting their backs. Uh, but whilst packaging the entire thing in a way that was extremely um, um, attractive and I f find that quite radical. It um, is. The second is an Icelandic uh, student whose name I can't read on the prompter and it's, uh, it's very uh, difficult. Uh, it's very little. <laughs> Yeah, it's, it's, it's a different, let's call him Bo. Uh, and um, the interesting thing about the Icelandic Art Institute is that they focus most of their graduation projects, uh, on, uh, their design graduation projects on uh, local sustainability and uh, local communities and uh, how to help the, um, how to help uh, people live around themselves. And uh, Bo, the student, created this, uh, um, this insect. Thank you. Thank you. He, he, yeah, it's perfect. Thank you. He created this uh, insect machine that regenerated itself in sort of a uh, closed continuous loop so that the insects larva would grow again and feed off the plants and exist um, forever. So that, that, that also won the prize. I found that to be extremely radical. So using design to change uh, just these small uh, problems in our, our society, yet whilst packaging them in an interesting fashion. And um, I find that quite, quite radical. Uh, another thing that's radical, it, which is quite simple, but um, the idea of um, uh, auto, uh, we have Enzo Mari auto progettazione here. Of course, and the uh, exhibition is closing soon at La Triennale. Yes, yes, precisely. Last dates. Uh, last dates, and also you won't be able to see his work for another 40 years. So if you haven't been to Triennale, I, I, uh, I suggest that you go see it yourself. Uh, the idea of open source is not new. Uh, this is the work of Axel Arne uh, it, it was from the early 1900 in Sweden, uh, and some of his works were actually uh, open source uh, works for other people to produce. And uh, more recently, we have uh, work like Ishim Nomaki uh, from Japan, who instead of manufacturing uh, work in Japan, they basically uh, have partnerships with manufacturers in every country so that uh, goods are not being shipped and everything is local. And finally, this is a piece that we did for Varni, which is a new local sustainable, uh, locally produced um, brand from Finland. Um, 
I went to Design Academy Eindhoven, uh, same as you. It was very uh, important uh, to us. One of the reasons that got me there is uh, the, some of the Brug, Drug pieces that I found completely radical at the time. So to me, the, this movement, the, the Dutch design movement, especially of this era, is, uh, was the biggest driving force for me to try and relocate. Uh, the do-hit chair is probably the... Uh, uh, it, it, was, it, it has a very radical uh, idea to it, but also what was was interesting if we look at the chest of drawers by Teho Remy is that it was just it was democratizing design and making design in a way that nothing was hidden uh, and a lot of people uh, were uh, judgmental about the movement at the time saying oh I could have done that but also the, it, the movement wasn't necessarily about that it was just about people understanding how things were made and uh, in a way that was um, very truthful and honest so that's one of the reasons why I went there uh, that was my graduation project. So I, I, I wow. It, yeah, <laughs> and I remember you like this. I mean, this is you. You, you should say that. Yeah, But this is this is me on the table. Are you uh, sure it's you? Yeah. Um, so uh, as there's probably uh, a lot of younger designers here, I thought I would just uh, talk about the path that I took to uh, to get here and the some of some of the decisions that I made. Anyway, so uh, at the time uh, at Design Academy Eindhoven, we were taught to question how things are manufactured and why and make lots of experimentations based on process. And uh, this is what I graduated with, which was a four meter long uh, inflatable table, uh, which um, I. I don't regret doing, <laughs> and um, that was um, that was the thing. This is my studio in London. Uh, we have Julian Camosa, who's my uh, my right hand man, and that's part of my studio here um, in London. Um, to oh wow, well, sorry. In London, to get a studio, it's quite difficult uh, um, to get a, a space that's decent. But we have 80 square meters in Hackney, and we're very happy with it. After living having a terrible studio for. For 10 years, we have somewhere kind of nice now. Um, when I graduate, oh, sorry, when, sorry. Very sensitive, don't worry. <laughs> yeah, and um, so just the path I took when I graduated school, uh, like a lot of uh, you young designers here, um, the most important thing was to get jobs. And uh, getting jobs is really difficult, and uh, you have to keep your. Um, You have to keep your mind open to the types of jobs that you can get. Uh, the job on the left is a chair that was for Volkswagen. Uh, they, they commissioned us to create a chair around a car that they were launching. And the chair on the right is a job that we had done after a few years after graduating for Gvadrat that asked us to create uh, furniture with uh, their products. We made these stools by using only fabric and uh, a little bit of uh, adhesive and by rolling it really tight so that the fabric would become structural. Uh, so a lot of our work at the time in the beginning was about experimenting with uh, materials, uh, you know, everyday materials you can find, MDF, uh, and, you know, trying to uh, pursue this idea of developing, uh, pushing, pushing the, the potential of materials. This is an exhibition that was actually curated by Maria Cristina. Uh, it was called Simple. It was a few years ago um, here in Milan. And after a few of these things and exhibitions, uh, eventually the industrials uh, gave us a chance. Uh, it takes, as you know, as the young designers here know, it takes a, a long time to get, be trusted by the industrials, to be trusted by big companies, to be given a chance to make something. Uh, so this is our, our first produced uh, item for Established in Sons, uh, the Molo. And then there's always a little photo on the left, and I guess I, I'm quickly going to explain how we come up with ideas. Uh, the one on the left was just an accident by stitching um, foam together, and that's how the shape of Molo came together. And most of my work is always an accident. It's By chance. By chance. <laughs> by chance. Um, always. But probably you have a lucky chance, I have to say. It, yeah. Um, but the, the, point, uh, uh, the point I'm trying to make is that uh, we make a lot of things. We design by making. And uh, the, the interesting thing that we will find is always by making one thing. So even if you do a simple action, no matter what the simple action, by folding a piece of paper or doing something else, you will always have an idea, which is a lot better than to look at other people's design or things like that. Uh, the press mirror that you see there, uh, it came because I was making a bracket to hang a shelf uh, onto the wall. And uh, it stood on itself. And And it was a mirror. Uh, so most of most of my work is always like that. This is a chair that was uh, basically taken from a lamp post on the street. Uh, it, it's a cocktail rotational chair for SCP. 
And um, okay, yes, this is a house bench that we did in Sweden. We were um, we we exist between the furniture world, the um, uh, the, the furniture design, mass produced items, and uh, the more special art projects. This one was we were asked to create a an outdoor bench in a park in Sweden, and uh, we came up with a very sim. Uh, we had a a special budget in mind uh, and uh, we came up with a way to have one mold and repeating it six times in order to create the shape uh, that you can see over there and um, you know uh, all ideas also come from somewhere else so there's a this idea came from these little bowls that we had made earlier on and but we then adapted that to architecture and then just repeated the the same idea um, these are, these are, this is a series that we did for uh, Itala, uh, glassware and, and uh, ceramics. And uh, these shapes are a shape that we initially developed for uh, a client that you can see here on the, on the left. Um, and a lot of it also, once again, comes from constant experimentation. Uh, how you come up with shapes is uh, usually just by making things without necessarily knowing where it will end up. And oh yeah, uh, a lot of times ideas can just be coming from uh, a simple, uh, simple place. Uh, on the left-hand side, you can see a, a small ball bearing, and we created these uh, ball bearing tables using nylon because it's self-lubricating uh, materials. Uh, it doesn't have any components; it's only one material, and uh, it rotates. It's extremely simple; just a pure, simple mechanism. Uh, uh, this is done for a gallery in New York City called Salon 94. Uh, we work with them a lot and we work with the industry a lot. Um, the same uh, can be seen here on the left hand side. We have a, a chest of drawers. It has no mechanism, no components. Uh, I, I, I would like to think it's radical because of that. It uses one thing uh, and it, all the components slide onto each other. And uh, you can see a table here in someone's flat in New York. Um, yeah, this is uh, ooh, very sensitive. Sisi Tapi, which is showing over here. Uh, these are rugs that we did for Sisi Tapi uh, a year ago. Uh, they came out, and as I, as I was saying earlier on, a lot of our products and a lot of our work that we do, they come from uh, doing a very simple action. And, ugh, sorry, that's another one. Very sensitive. Okay, um, and uh, this, this series of rug just came from doing line drawings with uh, crayon and uh, once again it came by accident because I happened to have crayons and uh, eventually uh, the people at CC Tapi, uh, Daniele, uh, found a way to dip dye uh, bits of yarn and re-knot uh, them in order to make this sort of um, effect happen. Pattern, yeah. So a lot of our work is kind of reverse engineering all the time. So we, we start somewhere that's either a shape or a concept or an idea. And then the fun part is reverse engineering it into mass production. And make mistakes. Yes, <laughs> make uh, lots of mistakes along the way. Usually they're the most beautiful part. <laughs> yes. Uh, yeah, so uh, most, mostly our work is errors and chance. And uh, we design later and come up with the idea to begin with. Um, another work that's shown here at Salone is the DS707 for Desede. It's uh, shown in the other hall. Um, this is actually quite funny because we came up with the design really quickly. I'd, I'd probably say uh, in, uh, in an, an afternoon. Uh, and all that we did in order to design this is taking uh, pieces of foam and folding it twice. So that's the one we can see on the left hand side here. Uh, we took a piece of foam, folded it once, folded it twice, and that was the um, that was the armchair, and then it became a sofa, and then we reverse engineered the entire thing. But the uh, original idea always comes from this very simple action that everyone can do. Um, and finally, uh, I'm currently living in Athens for the month, and uh, we are uh, spending our time in a steel junkyard, and we are doing some works about uh, um, recycling and upcycling uh, steel that we find in junkyards. And um, this work is meant to be uh, um, an exercise in uh, exercise in shape, but a very quick exercise in shape where uh, we don't spend too much time deliberating the proportions and try to come up with uh, 
um, configurations and new functions that work together. And this work is gallery work, but um, we're already seeing interesting solutions that could be used in a mass production work. Uh, this is where I spend my time wow. <laughs> right now uh, using a lot. Surfing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, correct. So that's where, uh, that's where I've been for the last two weeks, and that's where I'll be for the next two weeks uh, making uh, work. Once again, gallery work, uh, which f will hopefully inform our mass-produced work. And Great. That's it. Thank you so much for, let's say, sharing some of your works and projects. Andrea, from the south of Italy, from Sicily to this Nordic attitude, as I call it. Oh, gosh. <laughs> yeah. How do you, you and Simona from survive. Veneto, so, let's <laughs> so say, survive from the north and uh, were you able, let's say, to dialogue uh, with the industry as well with the very, again, radical projects for yourself, for galleries, for exhibition, for the serpent and for so many different, uh, let's say, specific and like, cultural subjects that are differ difficult and very different from the, from the industry side. So, well, uh, first of all, we just moved to Milano. So that's uh, also we are happy. news uh, <laughs> since actually a month. Very happy. Welcome After, back. Thank you. No, we are very happy. Now, actually, we've never been in Milano. So it's I the know. first time back really to Italy, back, back to Italy. Italy. And, uh, but that was very a good exercise because something that uh, uh, Holland gives, it's, uh, a va it's a kind of a vacuum. So it's, there's, you, there, you don't have noise. There's not so much production happening in, uh, in Holland. Uh, it's, uh, um, you know, they produce services, not, um, uh, yeah, it's not like Italy. It's completely opposi the opposite. You don't have Brianza in no, Holland. No, exactly. Uh, so in this sense, I think it was very important to look Italy from abroad. Indeed, like our work, uh, um, and today I'm going to show only one object, uh, one project later. Uh, it's all about really try to look at the design discipline uh, from an outside view and try to unpack the complexity of, of design. And I think being Italian and being all the time overloaded by the importance of design, because I mean, it's pr probably is the most important uh, country for design especially because of production, Help, this mm, displacement uh, in, in, in Holland helped us really to look at, at the country differently. And I have to say, um, you work very well there because uh, there is a lot of help from the government. We didn't get so many of it, of it um, also because we, we are Italian. So in any case, they, you know, they give much more money to, to of course, to Dutch people. Uh, but especially the beginning of our career was instrumental. As I said before, the fact that you can get a basic stipendium at, at really at the beginning of your career, That's there was like around 500 euro. It's nothing, but it helps a lot to establish a, a, a practice. Very low uh, uh, rent. And again, that was, you know, the, what you need to, to start your career. It was one year, eh? so it was not 10 years. Uh, uh, but that helped us to really establish the, the, the way of, of working, most of all. And uh, now I'm happy to be here. I think now we have the luggage and the, also the, the knowledge to be able to um, survive also in a context like Milano, that it is a very different one. Um, also for the work we do, because uh, as, as you mentioned, we do commercial work, but um, I would say the 70% of what we do in the studio is research. And I will show you a project later. And that means that we need to uh, make sure that the commercial work can pay the research one, because it's something that we... That's this the moment, balance, we are, let's uh, say. We need to find that balance, yeah. And it's uh, the same for you, Philippe? I mean, to find this kind of balance between... Uh, commercial projects and, and more, I would say, also research projects, because that's, no, it's, it, we're, we're, it costs to make research. It really does, but the lucky thing is that the sort of gallery world and the art projects, which are basically all research, very much have a dialogue with the production work, so the, thankfully they, uh, they finance each other back and forth, so that's, um, you know, it's like you, you can take time in order to do research for an exhibition that you have. And um, you, you might not have uh, money coming in from that, but then from the furniture sales, you might, uh, from the royalties, you might have, and then basically infl and it influences back and forth. So that's the, uh, that's the advantage. Allora, Andrea, we spoke about Simone that is not here because... And he's not coming yet, so it means that he's no, still flying. Because <laughs> you have overseen that since uh, 
2020, the Excuse me, I'm reading because it's difficult. To... Geo Design Department, Department at Design Academy in Eindhoven. So you are back to Eindhoven in a way, but with a completely new, let's say, task. And with a, what is the Geo Design Department? What, what are you in charge for? What are you studying with the students? And so, well, uh, we have been teaching at the Academy since a lot of years. Really, after we uh, finished studying, we immediately started teaching. It was like a one day role. And, uh, and, and since a couple of years, two years, uh, um, uh, Joseph Grima, that is the artistic director of uh, Design Academy, uh, we were speaking one night and we were discussing actually the project of the Serpentine Gallery. And immediately he understood that, uh, you know, we are more and more interested in education. So uh, he gave us the opportunity to found a new department that is called, as you said, Geodesign. That looks really into the infrastructure upon design perform. So we are really looking with the students of all the problematic, but also also the possibility of uh, the design discipline nowadays, but of course on the lens of the climate change. I think in these days we cannot like do anything without really thinking about this uh, huge subject. And it's not a department that in specific moment is media based. So uh, designers can uh, at the end graduate with a movie, they can graduate with the strategies, we can graduate with product. But uh, what we are trying to do compared to what was happening before with also uh, the design, speculative design, for instance, we are trying to do a step further. So for us, we want to have an impact. So we are trying to, with the students to work much more on a strategic level on um, possible like um, strategies that goes either in a short, medium or long term uh, um, uh, effect. Um, we don't have yet graduates. We are going to have it uh, this June. So, and I think it's already quite a challenge because, of course, we started during pandemic. But the students are amazing, and I, what I think it's amazing to be teaching uh, is that you engage with a new, um, uh, new generation that is preoccupied even more than us. I mean. You will see with one of the work we are presenting now, the project is quite uh, radical, but the, the students of now, it's even more radical. And they're not interested in just to do design for the sake of designing, but they really want to have an impact. So it's, a, it's, it's going to be a, a big, big uh, step, uh, hopefully for them to really be out of there. The problem is that we need to be sure that the companies and galleries and institutions are ready to take care of them. Because we also see with our work, with me, Philippe, and, and others, the design discipline, it's very tiny. And uh, we, know it, <laughs> we know each other, every one of us. But then it means that we need to create a generational designer that infiltrate on a different level in companies. Maybe as a consultant, uh, they, they need to really be on a different level than just simply designing. Because there's no space, simply that. And also in the finance and economics business. Yes. I think that we need the students to, Absolutely. Move, <laughs> Absolutely. to move things also from that side because we need, of course, no, the resources to, to change the world and to change our It's also a process of designing, even like doing a law, it's a designing process Absolutely. and they miss designers there. Absolutely. Va bene, Andrea, I think it's time for you to Sorry, present. I'm talking too much sometimes. No, 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 not at all. No, no, we are happy to. People are here, audience is here. But we see if Simone is up. For so the it's, moment, it's me. Start. I'm going to do it. So yes. well, um, I'm going to present Cambio. It's an exhibition actually that opened last uh, uh, March and closed immediately after at the Serpentine Gallery in London. And it was a commission from uh, uh, Serpentine and its artistic director, Ansuri uh, Kobrist, and the curator, uh, Rebecca Lewin. And um, when Ansurik contacted us, um, actually it was already three or four years ago, and we were already starting to uh, steer our practice towards uh, a much more research practice. By the way, we do product design, we do exhibition design, we, we do also much more uh, traditional uh, design, but uh, in the lens of uh, more research uh, thinking. And um, when... Um, oh, it's very sensitive, yeah. Uh, <laughs> now I understand what you mean. Um, uh, so Serpentine, it's a gallery, it's, little, it's a maybe. museum. No? So, yeah, no, I, there's no need to read for me, email. it's okay. Um, it's actually a museum, it's a public museum, it's a free, uh, so everybody can enter during the day. It, it sits in between of Hyde Park. Um, so, uh, Hyde Park it was also the site of uh, the first international exhibition, the, uh, the big expo. 
uh, that actually uh, was hosted in a beautiful palace created by uh, Joseph Paxton. And as you know, it was a crystal palace. So it actually was an object, an architecture that was meant to host um, trees and plants. But at that time, actually uh, hosted um, uh, objects. And I would say that the, um, that exhibition was the first exhibition that, that, in a way, started the big globalization that we are living now. You know, all the countries were, were meeting there to show their product. Uh, so for us, when we um, started to think about what we could do at, at the Serpentine, uh, we immediately, of course, connected to one of the major industry, and uh, that is the one of the wood. So cambio, of course, referred to the idea of change, and cambio is an Italian word. But cambio is also a layer that sits between the inner core of a tree and the, the skin of the tree. And it's actually the one that allows the tree to, um, to cope with climate change. You know, like Earth was very different 2,000 and 5,000 years ago. And trees were able to uh, go out from the sea and become the tree we know today. And this little uh, layer was the one helping that. So for us, it was a very evocative uh, name to, to, um, to talk about this, uh, uh, well, this issue. Um, so as I mentioned before, it's really where, uh, this exhibition uh, is really looking at the governance of, of the timber industry. And um, the, the first piece that you, you can see here is actually a tree. This tree comes from uh, the Val di Fiemme. The Val di Fiemme, it's a, a, it's a valley in the north of Italy that in 2018 has been uh, hit by a huge storm where more than 15 million of trees have been practically killed in, an, in one night. Uh, this because, of course, climate change, and th that is also a monoculture. It's only pine tree uh, with little root in, on stone. So, of course, like some uh, wind blown away uh, in one night, everything. So, for us, it was already a very important having, like, as a testimony, one of these three. But the tree also became the um, the objectification in the exhibition. So, all the exhibition furniture. Uh, that you will see, they are actually the um, what uh, sustain the, the research. So they are really pedestal and shelf. Uh, they are all done with one singular tree coming from the from that forest. And again, I think it's very important to say this that uh, you know we as designers we we can make choices, even like a small choice like choosing a tree that could rotten and cause like in any case phytosanitary problem in the forest can be used. And in this moment, for instance, there is still a lot of problem because big companies are buying wood, you know, from uh, Austria or from uh, other countries Brazil. instead of using, you know, this tree that is available and uh, in, in this forest. Um, well, I don't go really into all the all the work, but the the, work, the exhibition is divided in three sections. It's, it's like a big body of our collaboration. We're collaborating with scientists, with um, researcher, with the philosopher, uh, to really unpack the complexity. Um, I just maybe mentioned one of these installations in this hall, and I mean, I could spend probably an hour speaking about Cambio, but I'm, I will no, not make a, you bored. There's a, a website also, a fantastic exactly. yeah, website. There is a website, a catalog, and everything. But what is interesting, for instance, of this very simple uh, um, exhibition of like objects that you find nowadays in, in the market uh, that from the, the span from um, guitars to you know small stools. Um, the 70% of these objects they are uh, there shown are coming actually from illegal sourcing. This means that companies are using wood not even knowing where this wood coming from, even if they are certified. So there are a lot of certification. But in nowadays, like the, really the 70% of like the wood that escape the enter European Union, it comes from illegal sourcing. For this, for instance, we, could, we work with a, um, a Tunan Institute in Germany when we did forensic analysis of this object to really understand the provenience. And there we can find really objects from different brands. I don't want to not name, but if you go to the exhibition, you could see some of very well-known brands uh, that maybe they don't know where really they would come from. Um, one of other uh, installations there was uh, is called The Origin of the Species. Um, and actually what we did is to make analyze the famous book of the origin of the species. Um, and then we asked friends from all over the world to buy copies of it. And then we made analysis. And interesting enough, from Brazil to China to Australia, the 90% of this book actually come from one species only, that is eucalyptus. Um, 
this means that in the case of Brazil, that is the bigger exporter and producer of pulp, means that the majority, and we know, of course, we, we knew that already, the majority of like forests in uh, Brazil have been completely substituted from autochthon species to uh, eucalyptus, that is an uh, Australian uh, uh, tree. And go on, I mean, we can of course go on, go on and on, but uh, one important part of the exhibition is the archival part, because if we know this information is thanks to the work of an important archive, like the one of the Kew Garden in London, that uh, um, you know, collects his millions of years, uh, this uh, product. But I go ahead, otherwise we lose too much time, but if you're interested to know more about Cambio, we have a website called cambio.website. We did uh, a very um, interesting book, it's called, of course, Cambio, with uh, interviews and essay uh, that really tried to look at the design discipline towards this lens. So I hope you will enjoy looking at it. Grazie. Grazie molte, Andrea. Thank you so much. Now, I think that it, it's very interesting to have these two different approaches, far but close into the radical, let's say, topic, because thinking about the future, uh, awareness, uh, uh, doing really what is important, making the right choices, uh, that means also that designers could help and will help more and more the industry, especially you, maybe not the very, very young designers just, that just came out from the schools, but you can help the industry and here we are you know in the space where all the brands are confronting themselves with designers architects clients and people and and all around the world to understand how they can do better for next year for the years to come for the new generations also because many companies are you know companies established by fathers grandfathers and they need a guide i think that there's a lot of need of people that could support and help not just to produce a new object but to to have a process of designing that is behind the object uh philip just one final let's say advice about your the future and what you are uh, we can expect from you in the future, and then we open to a couple of questions uh, from the audience. Uh, perhaps not for, about me, but about um, what you were saying about um, changing uh, for the best in the future. Uh, the idea of uh, changing visual culture is interesting for the research that young students are doing, because if young students change the uh, expectations that we have from the furniture and design industry and change the aesthetic expectations, then perhaps the rest of the industry will follow along with that. So a lot a lot has to do with um, visual communication and uh, the idea of uh, desirable um, design. And um, I think that's quite interesting because you're starting to see a change in, uh, you know, manufacturing and products and materials used, but that comes from doing research and the, the work that uh, young people and uh, ourselves do in order to change things for the future. Right, Andrea? Well, what I would offer for the future, well, for the student thing to become more radical and, and more commercial, so I think, and to bridge the two, uh, uh, anime, soul, I don't know how to say it in, in English. Um, thanks God, I think also what you just mentioned, uh, Philippe, it's company also finally understanding that we need to do a radical change, uh, speaking about radical. And we also see with the request that, you know, company are starting to, to, to ask, uh, to us, um, you know, we are not only asked to design new product, but to really think about more strategically. Like, for instance, Cambio, uh, it's an exhibition that had, uh, you know, was within a museum. But then, for instance, Artec uh, asked us to look to their production and to, to uh, what they do in, in Finland. And they, because they are trying to bring completely back their um, production of uh, object there. And they asked us to look into the possibility of, the, of this. So I think what is interesting nowadays, the design and the intelligence of design can be used not only to, to design, but also more critically uh, to um, yeah, probably change and to help this company to, to transition to a different future. 
So to understand the design, the process, uh, the material, where does it come from and Absolutely. how many people were, it's what, ha uh, what is happening in fashion as well, no? Uh, I have to say, like, there are like certain sectors, uh, they are a bit more ahead than us. And of course, for me, food industry, it was already pioneering, you know, with a lot of years ago, with all these uh, um, bio and, you know, uh, labels. Um, fashion started also because of huge scandals a uh, couple of years ago. I think maybe we need some scandals in design too <laughs> to make really the f quicker the transition. Also, you know, when we visit like company, uh, we work with a lot of company everywhere. They are almost there. Eh? I mean, uh, they do very well. They think about the, uh, the, uh, the, um, the wealth of their employee. Uh, they are trying to have less impact as possible. But the big problem is actually not in the production, but is the, in the um, uh, material um, um, sourcing. It's where there is the biggest problem. It's not so much in how we produce. It's in where do material come from. It's there where we think we need to really put our attention on, with new labels, new way of thinking. Right. Because the, the physical community is there, so you are, you, you are taking care of them because they are close to you. But yeah, yeah, think about here. I mean, we are like very close to Brianza. Here it's yes. really zero kilometers. It, there's no problem. To, we, we, are, we are already ahead for that. It's not that the problem. But then when it comes to material is where we need to really th think more and the afterlife of object. So again, like durability Recycle should become like durable. paramount. Bene. Bene, we have time for one, maybe two questions. Ecco, una domanda. Say, if you don't mind to stand, maybe ju just to understand. Uh, tenga, tenga. Yes, hi, hello. I'm Sicilian like Andrea and I live in Amsterdam <laughs> currently, so we have a lot of, in common. And I always, so you mentioned a few companies, you mentioned Italy, you worked, you studied and you worked a lot in the Netherlands. And then we talked about Italy and looks like to me, um, as I also work in the industry, that um, Northern European companies are a bit more open to this change compared to maybe Italian companies. Is that true in your experience? Um, yeah. Do you want to reply? Well, I have to say no. No, I think it's very similar. It's also depending on the um, the structure. You know, like Italian company. I mean, I'm also generalizing because Italy is like hundreds years of history. But you know, like in the Northern Europe, I think there are much more also smaller company, much more dynamic. When I think about Italian company, most of the time they have the number and the structure that is much more tentacular and much more heavy. So um, it's more difficult to make changes there. Um, of, I would say yes, maybe there is more sensibility in the Northern Europe than in the, in the South, um, but things are changing a lot. I think also because of the, let's say, civil rights, I mean, in the Northern part of Europe, uh, uh, because also of the population and the, it's, there is a more, uh, there is an awareness uh, that is different from ours because of also of the Mediterranean culture that is not so into rights, no? What is right and what is wrong? Yes, uh, perhaps uh, Nordic countries have this very strong social sentiment and this social sentiment is probably something that uh, this, this very pro-socialist uh, sentiment, like we're talking about companies like Itala and when you go visit a factory, uh, the well-being of its uh, workers and the whole structure that's there has been built around a political system that's been around for, uh, for a very long time and that does reflect in how a company operates and if you go to other countries that didn't have necessarily the social uh, push uh, within its uh, own politics will obviously reflect into the way things are manufactured. Let's say that welfare is something that in Italy is just starting in a way, in terms of... Uh, yeah, but company, I have to say, in times, they've been always caring for the employee. I, I mean, like visiting like the, the company absolutely. in Italy, I all the time found... Absolutely, but in an informal way. Yeah, of course, privately. I mean, as always, you, know, you need to be a private to, to do something in Italy, otherwise, you know... Yeah, and it's also because it's your cousin or it, you know, absolutely. they are living, uh, it's my neighbor, it, it's my place where my kids go to school, so... Yeah. But I feel I, part of it, but it's not established by law, no? No, totally. Yes. Anyway, another question, if we have it, or... Um, si, ah, scusa, grazie. Oops. Sorry the, for the giving the, the shoulder double all day. Sorry. 
Vi abbiamo dato la schiena, sorry for our back. Right, yeah. I, I can also talk just to the TV and you can turn around. Uh, no, I have a question for like young designers as me. I'm graduating soon. If there was actually two questions, if there was one decision that you took that was maybe risky or drastic that turned out to be the best one you took or a really important one for your career. And on the opposite, if there was something where you were maybe hesitating or something that you would spare us from that you would not do again, maybe. I, I think I can answer one. Uh one of your questions, maybe. Um, for me, it was uh, working for another designer. Uh, one of the reasons I survived in London um, uh, was for designing furniture for other designers. And um, that would I would say that's one of the most important things I did. I didn't really want to do it when I graduated, but it did allow me to, when you design for someone else, you can over time know exactly what you like and you don't like. And this is how you eventually know how to design for yourself properly by designing for other people. So I would say that that's one of the things that helped me have my own studio and develop my own language is this decision. Well, it wasn't really a decision because I was going to starve to death otherwise. Um, but um, yeah, so that's a, a recommendation I would make. Yeah, maybe another one. I agree totally with Philippe and we did a similar uh, path. Um, well, something that you usually have when you graduate, it's uh, uh, you're desperate. It's, you pass through a desperation period. And what you do is actually say yes to everything. Something that we intentionally did since the beginning, also because we worked before actually starting as an academy, is we understood that there's nothing to lose in doing bad job. So what we did since the beginning is to say no, because in any case, it doesn't pay. It doesn't pay well if you do a shitty object or if you do a shitty collaboration. So in a way to be much more brave at the beginning and don't be afraid of uh, taking the risk of maybe not eating very well during the evening or sleeping less or, or living not in an amazing apartment. I think you can do at the beginning. Uh, of course, while you grow more, then you take more compromise. Uh, but also compromise, I think, is something that we need to learn to do more in general. Because um, um, if we come back to the ecological problem, you know, nothing is perfect. You know, like there's no company that they are like uh, virtuous. So the only way of doing it, it's really just also embrace the fact that we can maybe change it to 1% and the 1% is enough and is already helping a lot. Thank you, grazie, grazie. Bene, so thank you for being here. I have to say that we are happy that we are so many and that, that's uh, really a pleasure for thank you. Thank you, Francesca, for hosting and Maria that's Cristina because, that I hope. You. Because of you too. So um, have a good time in Milan, short, long. I don't know, and Philippe, Very long. when you decide to move to Milan, they, you have your, their studio and you can move, share, no? That's, yes, that's a great idea. If you, if you find me a, a giant affordable studio, I will definitely... <laughs> Consider. Well, I'm, I'm going to work on it. Grazie e buon uh, super salone.